Some time ago, I had a conversation with my grandparents. They were taking stock of their lives, and they told me how astonished they were how much the world has changed in the last couple of decades, how much humanity has progressed. This is them actually getting married in 1963. Back then, the world was completely different. My grandfather was working as a blacksmith, shoeing horses, because in the early 60s, horses still played a big role in agriculture in Germany. When I tell them today about things I'm passionate about, like artificial intelligence and disruptive technologies, then this is very hard for them to grasp. My grandfather still thinks the internet is inside of my phone. He doesn't even kind of get a concept. So if you think about it, never has a generation in human history at the end of their life experienced greater change, greater progress than this generation. Let's have a look at the timeline of humanity. Through the lens of, let's say, very decisive, life-changing inventions. Let's plot some of them. Let's start with the invention of the wheel, the invention of the compass, the discovery of gunpowder, the development of the printing press, the steam engine, the electric bulb, the airplane, the nuclear bomb, the internet, search engines, the iPhone, and maybe something super recent, the rollout of mRNA vaccines. So looking at this, you might say, actually, the distance between these developments is not equal. Why is it equal on the timeline? Let's fix, the, fix that. Let's make the timeline geometric quick. What you clearly can notice is that most of these developments have been rather recently. So the density of innovation is very high now. The more you go back in time, the more sparse it gets. So if you plot this kind of as a function, you get this acceleration in the visualization. Now you might say, I just chose a small subset of inventions to make a point, right? But actually this holds to be true, even if you take hundreds or thousands of inventions. This is not only true for overall technological progress, it's also true for distinct, specific technological developments. But if you go back in time and you think about it, tens of thousands of years ago, let's say from 20,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, life was more or less the same for thousands of years. Whether you have lived 500 BC or 800 BC, 900 BC, life was more or less the same for hundreds of years whether you left 1710 or 1760, life was more or less the same for decades. Nowadays, already 10 or 15 years make a huge difference. Think about how different the world was just 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Almost nobody had a smartphone. Social media didn't play a role. Nobody was talking about AI. So let's look at a very distinct, specific technological development. What do you think, how much do I have to travel back in time until this smartphone, which is not even cutting edge, is the most powerful supercomputer in the world? What's your intuition? It's measured by, let's say, computations per second or floating operations per second. It turns out, even though this is a little bit debatable, but approximately 20 years ago, this would have been the most powerful supercomputer in the world, would have cost millions of dollars, and obviously would have been much bigger. In this case, for computational performance per constant dollar, it's very well investigated, so we know this is an exponential development. The great question is, when are developments exponential? Let's look at it through a very simplified example. Let's plot the metric on the y-axis, which is progress, and let's plot the time at the x-axis. Usually, a technological cycle in economics goes like this. It's an S-curve. In the beginning, a technology develops rather slowly. Usually there's a lot of hype in the market and then this, this hype gets disappointing. But then you have an acceleration phase and then in the end you have kind of a plateauization, a ceiling. But this opens a, a new door for a new technological cycle. The interesting thing is now that the second technological cycle doesn't start at the same base. The level is a little bit increased. So we always build the next generation of technology with the previous one. We always take our, our current tools to build the next kind of generation. For example, the iPhone was only possible because a number of other technological cycles came to an end in battery storage, in computation, um, um, for example, in cam camera, digital technology, and so on. 
So, if you continue plotting this, what you can see is that basically this overall is a recursive self-improvement that leads to a compounding effect. This is why, in theory, this develops exponentially. If you would take some very innovative person from our time, and obviously this is debatable, but let's take Elon Musk as a controversial figure and put him into the Stone Age, he would not be as nearly as innovative as he can be now, because now he can leverage everything that's already there, all the technology, all the education, the knowledge, all the capital, all the people. Why is it interesting that something develops exponentially? Well, because we humans have a very bad intuition about future developments that are exponential. Evolutionary, nothing was exponential. So when you were hunting an animal in the Stone Age, it didn't, its speed didn't increase exponentially, right? So when you are at that point and, and you want to predict the future, usually what people tend to do they predict it like this, while the reality might look like this. This is what we call an exponential gap. And there are numerous examples in the history of humankind where people have wrongly predicted exponential functions. A famous example is the Human Genome Project. It's a billion-dollar initiative launched in 1990 uh, to decode important parts of interest of the human genome. And seven years into the project, only 1% of the human genome was actually decoded. So Critical Voices said, 1% after seven years, it will take 700 years to finish this project. But actually what they didn't take into account is the exponential increase in decoding density. And so only six or seven years later, in 2003, 2004, the project was completed. And actually it didn't stop then. For the next almost 20 years, this technology further evolved. The next generation was always built up on the previous one. And so nowadays you can decode your genome for a couple hundred, maybe only a hundred dollars. Bill Gates once brought it great to the point. He said, we always all overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, and we underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10 years. This is not only true for technological processes, it's all also true for more theoretical examples. Maybe many of you are familiar with this great example, like this ancient chess story, from India, where the king was, asked, was asking a traveling sage what he wants as a prize if he defeats him at chess. And the sage, obviously a very smart person, right, said, I don't want a lot, I just want a little bit of rice. Let's say one rice corn on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and so on. Obviously, the resulting amount of rice vastly exceeded the wealth of the king. So now, I gave you some examples for exponential growth, and you might now think, Actually, how bad can I be, right? Maybe I have a great intuition now. I can predict the future, when it's, even when it's exponentially. Let me show you that you don't. Let's take one sheet of paper, which is 0 0.1 millimeters thick. And now let's go 40, 42 steps, once linearly and once exponentially. 42 steps linearly would mean we just take literally 42 sheets of paper, we put them on top of each other. The resulting amount is 4.2 millimeters. Now let's do the same thing, but let's go exponentially. So a great visualization for that basically would be that you take one sheet of paper, you cut it by half, you put the two pieces on top of each other. You cut the resulting stack by half, put the two pieces on, to on top of each other. You do this for 42 times. How big is the resulting stack? It's not so easy, right? We don't have a great intuition for it. I don't know what you now have in mind, but this is literally the result. It's the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So 2 to the power of 42 times 0 0.1 millimeters is approximately 440,000 kilometers. Assuming that exponential progress also has some exponential nature, uh, that technological progress also has some exponential nature, you might be as wrong intuitively about the future as you were just now in this example. Let's take another thought experiment. Maybe you have heard this quote, uh, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. A person from 1700, that was before the first industrial revolution, traveling to our current time would literally, it, it would be like magic for that person. That's why I call it here the magic future. 
if we let that person travel to our current time, it would not just be astonishing for that person, it would literally be overwhelming. So you could imagine it would be so much that that person would actually end up in psychiatry directly. The interesting question is now, how much do you have to travel into the future to have that same magic psychiatry effect? Having this exponential framework in mind, it wouldn't say 320 years, but merely at two decades. The first person in history who looked at this and kind of saw this pattern of exponential progress was that guy. His name is John von Neumann. He's one of the, or maybe the most uh, influential mathematician of the 20th century. And in the 50s, he looked at history of mankind and he said, the ever accelerating progress of technology gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. Well, it's the first time that ever anybody brought the term sing singularity to technological progress. But what is actually a singularity? Among other things, it's borrowed from physics. This is the first ever taken photo of a black hole, actually from 2019, quite recent. Physicists think that inside of a black hole, space-time is so curved, it's actually almost infinitely curved, that our physics models of the universe are not applicable anymore. So we don't actually know what's going on in there. We have no clue. So the further you go into the center of the black hole, the more space-time is curved, and inside it's almost infinitively curved. Accordingly, a technological singularity is a hypothetical point in the future where progress becomes so fast that we literally cannot predict the next day. And this is so fascinating. So think of the progress we now have done in 100 years being conducted in one year or in one second. Obviously, this is just crazy, right? But it's a theoretical example, and usually people, when talking about the singularity, also very much combine it with great progress in artificial intelligence that's also recursively self-improving. But how does the technological singularity look like? Well, not like this guy, but he's a very important figure in this overall discussion. His name is Professor Werner Winch, also professor for mathematics from San Diego State University. And he said, well, thinking about the singularity, he picked up kind of these thoughts from John von Neumann. He said, the explanation exercise would be like trying to imagine how we could explain our present era to a goldfish, goldfish or a flatworm. It's intrinsically inaccessible. Now, I told you some crazy stuff, right? And I have to admit and make a disclaimer that this is a very controversial concept, even in the AI community. So, why should you care? I think there are two essential reasons. First, the concept is incredibly fascinating, regardless of when or if it occurs at all. From a philosophical, from an intellectual standpoint, it's really exciting to think of the future with this exponential framework. Second, the consequences of continued exponential progress would be beyond our imagination. So, a positive vision would be technological answers to, for example, climate crisis, the end of all diseases, eternal life, a lot of wealth. The negative vision would, of course, concern a lot of stress for our society, for democracy, for daily life. It would even question what it means to be human. So, even if my arguments or the arguments I brought are flawed, and there's only a small probability that something like a singularity would lie in the future, I think the consequences would be so dramatic that we should talk about it today. Anyway, I think we live in very exciting times, and I'm already looking forward to having the same conversation I had with my grandparents, with my future grandchildren. Thank you.